H E L L O. It's random. Does anybody get the reference? Well, that is me saying hello to you, my fellow randoms, and welcome to this, the 27th episode of What's Your Random Podcast. My name is Kev Duffy. I'm the host of the show here, but really the guests are the stars. And on this podcast, I discover and celebrate those guests and their independent and individual creativity from the inception of their ideas to the process and the practicalities of bringing those ideas to life. I try to explain it every time a different way, but basically you have an idea. How do you get that idea into something tangible that you can share with others? And tangible might not be the right word um, because some things like music to our ears, we are just not able to get a grasp on, get a, get a hold on them, catch them in our hands and hold them. Um, but nonetheless, they communicate something special that was born out of somebody or a group of people's minds. Um, so that is what I explore here on the podcast. And thank you for joining me. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please do share your favorite episode. You probably know a couple of other creatives and those creatives may benefit from hearing, uh, my interview with others and what my guests have to share in terms of how they approach their process. Sometimes it's even nice to just find commonality like, Oh, that person does this thing in a similar way to the way that I do it. I benefit in that way quite often myself. And yeah, today was a great episode with a great guest. Joining me on What's Your Random Podcast is Dion Burton, aka DC Burton uh, of Soapbox Creatives. And he is the creator of a series that is currently funding on Kickstarter. So Go, go check it out and then come back here for the interview. And that series of comics is called The Necros. And he plans to cover eight issues over two years. And he's currently funding the first issue of that series. We had a great discussion about putting yourself in the right creative mindset, the right approach to getting the job done when it really is just you managing yourself. And a lot of other really process oriented topics that I loved exploring and Dion had a wealth of input and a wealth of uh, insight into his own process and I really enjoyed it and I hope you do too. So without further adieus and don'ts, my fellow randoms, I give you Dion Burton. Enjoy the random. <laughs> So welcome. We're jumping right in. I just uh, met Dion 10 seconds ago or so and uh, introducing him to What's Your Random Podcast. Uh, Dion Burton is a comic book creator and author, and he currently has a Kickstarter that's ongoing for his project, The Necros with a K. Um, and yeah, welcome, Dion. Dion is also, I think, the lead person of Soapbox Creative, um, which is a comic book publisher. So we're going to dive into all of that today uh, over the course of our discussion. So welcome, Dion. Hey, glad to be here. Um, so yeah, we could just start off. You could introduce with whichever makes sense in order of operations. If you want to talk about Necros and introduce that first, or if you want to, if it makes more sense to start off by talking about uh, Soapbox. I'll start with Necros. Uh, to me, that's what came first. So that's where I'll start. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I would love to hear how that preceded the publishing company, because obviously I'm sure they're both intimately re related. Yeah. So um, the story of the Necros started about four years ago. Um, so that's when I started writing um, in a more, I'll say professional sense, just trying to, to get more serious about it. Um, so the Necros actually started as a short story back then. So um, in those days, it, um, even though I read a lot of comics, I've always been like a lifelong Green Lantern fan. Um, it was not that I was trying to write a comic. I was just trying to write good stories. Um, 
And it was about a year ago when I wanted to transition to making a comic. And um, I was like, I turned in a, a few of these different short stories. Uh, one of the ones that I always got a lot of love was the Necros. Um, and, and a lot of the, the ratings I would get back for them, critics would say there was a good originality in the story. Um, so that was definitely something I wanted to run with. Um, so it was out of the idea that, okay, I want to make this into a comic book that Soapbox was actually born. So um, that's how the story actually proceeded, the, the publishing company. Oh, awesome. Awesome. And when you were writing these stories and getting feedback, like, you know, maybe you could talk to a little bit more the origin story even before a year ago when, when this started to come to fruition. Like, who are you as a writer? And mm -hmm. um, and how did you transition from maybe just writing stories? What was that transition like? Yeah, so for me, um, I've always been a fan of mythology as well. So um, when I got into writing, it was just natural that everything kind of related to mythology in some shape or way. Um, very also just government type of things, like just understanding like corrupt governments and and just like how power dynamics play with different people and just on a cultural level. Um, so I would write, you know, I'll write sci-fi, I will write fantasy. Um, I'll explore a little bit of both worlds, um, usually with the fantasy side, delving into a, a, more of the mythology, sci-fi side, delving in more of just the, the political sides of things. Um, and for the Necros, I'll say it actually has a bit of both, which is kind of where this story got unique is, um, you get the mythology of, you know, the main character that we're following is Matthias, who is trying to hunt down this demon uh, called the Necros. Um, and it's something that's haunted his world for almost 300 years. And it's, it's deep within embedded the, this mythology into this world. Um, but then there's also the struggles of uh, the, the powerful people in the society uh, those who kind of hold more of the information uh, called the elders um, and just the dynamics of how their motivations play into how uh, the world kind of behaves and just all of those dynamics coming together, making it more than just like a uh, action, one person versus one person, just trying to, you know, let's kill the beast. That's most of the story. Like there's a lot more to it, which I think helped grow uh, just the, the interest when you, when you start reading the story. Yeah. And there's a, on the Kickstarter, you also have a little bit of a teaser, 12 pages or 14 pages or so. Um, and it really does a perfect job of introducing not only Matthias, but also slowly unraveling and unveiling the world in which he lives. And, you know, you mentioned that there's some elders that are guiding some of the, the younger warriors and all of that information is transferred to readers like very quickly, but very eloquently. So uh, good job, because th that's not easy to do to articulate, <laughs> you know, that much information without saying it too directly. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it definitely sucked me right in. And I'm sure anybody listening will have a similar experience. So outside, I, I guess, of the those 12 pages for the preview, um, you know, without spoiling the comic, of course, because we want to all have that organic first impression reading of it. But, you know, what else is there? Uh, how, how big is the world in your mind? I know that you and I both are familiar with um, Ennead, uh, Jeff Johnson's mm -hmm. Kickstarter and, and comic book. Um, and I know his world is just like, crazy huge existing in his <laughs> mind and he's slowly getting it out of his mind onto paper. Um, how, how big is your world? You know, for me, the mythology and, and fantasy genre is interesting because of course I've engaged with it to some degree, but it's not my primary genre when I mm -hmm. read comics and books. And so it's interesting to see how different creators a approach a genre that can be, you know, very personal, you know, maybe you're focusing very closely on uh, Matthias, or maybe it's really big, like uh, something that, that Jeff is doing. So yeah, please, you know, elaborate a little bit more if you can on the, the environment and, and the universe. Yeah. So I'll say this first book as a part of like 
Um, and when I say book, so I guess I'll start with this. To me, the Necros, um, there's eight issues that make up what I call this first book. And there's three books that are going to be uh, told of the Necros to kind of uh, complete this full storyline. Um, so for me, these three books really take a, a, a look at this large world and we kind of zoom out as we go through. So the first book is kind of focused, um, you know, we're, we're focusing on Matthias lives in one of the seven nations a ton. So we hear a little bit about some other nations, but we're not really exploring those. We're not really getting into those. Uh, as we get into book two and three, that's when we really start to see the world grow after we really get that solid foundation first of just like what's going on and, and getting exposed to these things. Um, so needless to say, like, I look forward to those, even though I know those are far, far away. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think in that same way, it's like, there's, there's so much that, you know, I, for me, at least I've been thinking about this for for probably like three years, just, you know, writing, drafting, writing about side characters, writing about side stories. Um, some of which will probably never see the light of day, but it's just expands, like you said, how you see in your mind, this whole world that you've created. Yeah. Yeah. So rewinding back the, those three years was, and you know, you were fleshing out the idea is that three years ago was the inception of the Necros as a, as a, or I guess the world is actually called Awa, if I, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Um, so is three years ago the inception of this original idea and that from that point you started building it out or is this idea even a little bit older something that you had been flirting with for even you know longer ago than just three years so no it actually did the inception did pretty much come three years ago so it's that short story there wasn't much like back thought to like what is this world it was like i just want to write this like cool cool story, cool interaction between like this team, kind of like, kind of like we've seen like alien or predators, uh, probably more so on predators, where it's like you have this team of like skilled people, but they're still like, no matter how skilled they are in like human terms, like they're still outmatched against what they're going against. Um, so that's kind of where that premise kind of started, but through writing it, rewriting it a few times, adding stuff here and there, that's when it just started to build into a world. Um, and from there, it just really took off. I mean, it was, it definitely was nowhere close to as big. I, I think if I were to go back in time, I wouldn't even imagine me creating a world this, this detailed and big at that time. <laughs> that's, I think that's what happens when you have an idea that just like really resonates with you. And then you go to bed and just not even thinking actively about it, but subconsciously like ideas for that universe start popping into your mind that's when you know that you're like really into it yeah there are a few nights where i had been very close to sleep and then it's just like oh wait that just popped into my head grab my phone start typing away <laughs> just, like, just like i have to make sure i don't lose this because this is some good stuff <laughs> yeah good on you i think a lot of people including myself from time to time like you'll be like ah, i'll remember it in the morning you never remember <laughs> never in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you got to grab your phone and write it down. My my girlfriend will be like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm writing notes. Don't don't mind me, even though I'm waking you up and disturbing the household. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's going to be five minutes worth of notes, but then 30 minutes later, it's like, okay, yeah, now yeah. I'm finished. Now I'm finished. See, I'm more like, I'll, I'll make one note really quick, like not even half a sentence. And then I'll like lay back down, put the phone away, like get comfortable again. And then... Once I get comfortable again, I'm like, oh, got another idea. And I'll just continue that for 30 minutes uh, instead of just getting it all done in one shot. But you need right. that restful like reset, right? To have the ideas start flooding back in, at least for me. Yeah, it seems like when your mind is most relaxed, that's when it just opens up to all these different ideas. <laughs> right, yeah. So is there anything else you do? You know, on this podcast, I try to explore not just the projects themselves, and the creators, but practices and processes of mm -hmm. those creators to get into a creative space where ideas are flowing naturally and you're not pushing yourself, but rather things come naturally. Is there anything else you do besides just going to bed <laughs> to help, to help think, uh, facilitate for those ideas? I think for me, and, I, and I'm trying to remember where I learned it from or just heard about it, but um, I think for me, 
I can write consistently, but when it comes to the ideation area, I need to just either slowly let it build or just kind of be in that mind frame. So um, it's usually like right now I'm writing the script for issue three of the Necros. Um, you know, that's, I can, I can be very scheduled about that. Okay. Get an hour every day where I write. That's fine. But when it comes to trying to build an idea, I can't schedule it out. I just have to let it come to me. Um, but I have to like, almost like set aside. So like right now I know that like, there's another comic in my head called conquest, which is like, again, a, a old story that I'm like, I, I know I want that to be kind of the next thing I do. And, uh, pro possibly working into an anthology. So it's like right now I'm just in the ideation stage. So every day I think about it. Every day I, you know, just let it come to mind, let myself think about it. If there's something that, that clicks, write it down. If there's not, just let it go. But I like have it in my mind that like probably for the next 30 days, I'm not going to write anything about it, like write the story, but I'm just going to think about it. And that helps me almost like that brainstorming session to write everything down and then figure out later what works instead of crossing things off while you do it. I think it lets me do that better because then I can, I have this, this giant block that I can scope down instead of just trying to force myself to, to, to shape something. So I think that's what I've learned has worked well for me. Yeah, that's interesting. So as you get ideas over the next 30 days, you'll jot them down or put them in your phone. So you don't lose them, of course. And right. then uh, when the time comes to write, you have that kind of bank of bullet points that you could pull and reorganize and throw away if it doesn't fit. And, uh, and as you're writing, then you said you don't really get too many ideas as you're writing, but in that initial writing phase, when you're filling in the blanks between those bullet points and dots, mm -hmm. are you still in a creative mindset where ideas are flowing? That's how it is for me. Um, when I sit down to write like a first draft and even a second draft, like right. the ideas are coming to help me get from point A to point B. And then, and then I go to point Z somehow. And then like, <laughs> I'm not even in the alphabet anymore. I don't know where I am. So then my first draft ends up becoming just like a mess and a cluster of ideas that then I need to whittle down again. So I wonder if that's similar for you. No, I think that's, I think that's definitely the case. Um, I'll probably say I can probably get a good like 25% into a story without changing too much. And then it just starts to veer and veer and veer. And then it's like, uh, it was supposed to end over here, but now we're all the way over here. So we just have to, we have to work with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you could decide, do I like, is there some point of correction that I have to bring it back? Cause it's really important. Mm -hmm. Or was that a awesome organic development that I just let it go as it went and exactly it's better served by going that direction. Yeah. yeah. Try not to hold myself too tight to anything. Just be free with it. Let it come to you and just be along for the journey. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to say that about your own thought process and your own mind, right? Like, to be al right. along for the journey of your own creative process, but it's very, uh, that's very well, well said, I think. But it's funny because even with your characters, it's like they start to come alive to a point where it's like, you know what, I wrote that they do this, but now that I've written 10,000 words about them, I recognize that they wouldn't do that. So now I just have to adjust and, and, and do what fits better. But it's like, you know, my characters tell me what they want to do. I don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> So was there a lot of uh, transition and, and editing and change between the short story and, you know, what you're putting now on paper for the comic? Yeah, there, there has been. So uh, one of the things I'll say is like the, the side characters to me have been the biggest growth that I've noticed. Um, they were not as dynamic. Their motivations were, were kind of, not as fleshed out as as they are when I went back and wrote the full comic um which probably has to do with you know it was just a short story versus a full full you know graphic novel um that it will be um but in doing that that just has changed how some of how some of the story comes about um so that's definitely been an area that's been fun for me to play with because I think as I also write those characters it's like I think about the type of people who were like probably gravitate towards them 
was like, yeah, Matthias is, is the main character, but you know, there's some people who, who are going to see Johan and be like, yeah, I really, I really like him. And there's some people who are, who are you know, who are the opposite. There are certain characters who are going to be like, I hate them. And it's supposed to be like that. But, <laughs> but it's fun to like realize that as you go through the process of like, yeah, this is, this is going to make people mad, but in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> And in terms of like the development of those characters, are they developing more because the world and the universe is getting more fleshed out in your own mind? Or are they developing more just to support uh, the main character or you know something else? Maybe they're developing because y- you realized some character trait that was missing or something that resonated with you that, you know, in my own experience, and this is getting pretty specific, but you know, you could have four issues down the road. You realize that you want this character to do this and you start planting seeds for it. Now it could be something like that. So I I wonder through which of the many possible routes, and there's many more that I didn't say, uh, did those characters start to become more real for you? Yeah, I say there's definitely a mix of mix of them all. So um like there's certain characters that um just realizing as I write further, like you said, where they're gonna be and the where they get to, just you kind of plant those seeds earlier. There's certain things that, you know, once I get to a certain part in the story, the uh, a question may come up and it may be answered with a flashback. And as I think that forced me to think more about that character's backstory like years ago. And then I'm like, okay, now that I've kind of added that to their backstory, now I kind of have to make that fit and, and show in their character a little bit more. Um, and then there is just some like how the world interacts with them and how they interact with the world um, just with how it plays out in the present moment. So I feel like it does have that sense of like the past, the future, and then some of how the world plays out in the present that, that affects how those characters grow and change. And um, I think that's, you know, like you say, it's, it's, it's almost how it's supposed to happen of like, that's just, I think it's natural what happens in life. So I, I think that's the best thing to draw on because when a story is, is like real life, that's when a story is almost at its best. You know, it can be magical and have dragons that are 100 feet tall, but there are still elements of it that we can relate to in real life. That's what that's what we kind of have to bring it back to almost as authors of thinking about how it still relates to us. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, really important storytelling wise. And the stories that I enjoy most and are most I'm most impressed with are the ones that know when to put information out there and when information is not necessary. And that's like always as a story writer, a difficult negotiation. Um, Definitely. Intent wise, what is, you know, what's the purpose of having certain information in there? And then sometimes you have information in there that doesn't play out until further along in the story. And then, then it's like, you know, even more impressive because it, indicates that the the writer was really uh, conscious of the overall plan whether it's a mm-hmm. character's development or, or the themes of the story or things like that so it's it's cool to hear that you're thinking of those things and uh yeah it's similar um just to refer back to my conversation with Jeff, because you guys are writing in a similar space. Uh, I'm feeling a similar resonance with how stories develop in my own mind. And maybe it's just something about the, the fantasy genre and the epic fantasy genre. So maybe you could speak more to your interest in this genre and um, other, you know, comic book, you say comic books, somebody else answers superheroes, but that doesn't <laughs> seem to be the route that you're taking um, with, you know, the Necros or Soapbox Creative. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, your, what you've digested, what you've read comic wise and story wise, uh, what interests you most about this genre yourself. And then, uh, 
if you have read a lot of superhero stuff and and if why you would decide to go the direction of uh you know looking closer at fantasy and, and thriller and horror and uh sci-fi which i think is kind of the direction of soapbox mm-hmm. so yeah and uh yeah i think that is a good segue to, to introduce more about soapbox um so yeah soapbox really the idea for that is um using comics in a more literary way um so with soapbox everything is a limited series so um as you said a lot of people associate comics with superheroes a lot of people associate superheroes with a never-ending story people are going to die people are going to come back because this is going on for so long they have to um but i think there's a certain power to like having a succinct beginning middle and end to a story that just makes it all the more powerful um and that's really what I wanted to touch on and, and, and with these comics. Um, and at the same time, just looking more at genre-based comics because I think there is that strong association between um, comics and superheroes, but there is a lot of potential to create these beautiful stories uh, in these in comics that, you know, we still would, would be able to get them otherwise, like, of course, they're still great when they're in books, but it gives a different element and a different feel to it. And it just allows it to take up a whole different space. Um, and one of the things I, I talk about is like the logo to soapbox, just like um, a person with sitting on, you know, a little box with a, with a pad and a pen. And to me, it represents, you know, the, it, the process is simple. You, you put your ideas on a paper um, and you get up, you say what you have to say and you get down, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just that right there. So you're not, you're not up there forever. Um, I think everything I, I write has a specific message to send to people, um, for people to grasp. But, you know, once I've said that message, that's my message and that story is gone. Um, the necros, the world of Awa may come back in some different way, but that's not the plan. The plan is for, <laughs> for these stories to be out there and then that to be that. Um, so yeah, with that said, um, I did grow up reading a lot of superhero comics, um, but I found myself gravitating towards a different element of those stories. So like to me with Green Lantern, I really got into it when G. O. John started writing and he expanded it just from like a Green Lantern to like the whole spectrum. Now there was, you know, these beasts that, uh, that they got their powers from that, that inhabited each color. So, you know, there was kind of like the mythological animals. There were, you know, the people in charge. There were the different colors, which all kind of represented a different belief system. Um, so it was those things that still I gravitated towards, even though it was in there. But it was like, what if that was more of the comic? What if, what if it was less superhero and more of those things? Um, and I think one of the funny things that gave me inspiration is actually like uh, the Netflix limited series. Um, I don't know why that made it click for me, but it was like, I feel like that's like the same space that Soapbox is trying to take. Like there's TV shows which go on until they're canceled. There's movies which are like the graphic novels where it's just like a one shot. We get it. We get there. We're out. Um, but with these, you get to take a lot of the deeper look so the limited series like on netflix of course you might get like you know six hours worth of content to this one story instead of two hours and through that they're able to grow a lot more and uh dive a lot deeper into these worlds and i think with epic fantasy that's pretty much a must like <laughs> with with a world so big it's, it's hard to just do one graphic novel and say and introduce people to a world introduce people to a story and close it all out um so it was something about that when I was just watching one of them and I was like, that's, that's it. Something about that clicks with me and it just, it just made it all make sense. Um, so yeah, I think that would, that would, you know, there's, there's always like a lot of small things that play into, you know, what may seem like a grand idea is, is a lot of small things coming together in the right ways. So um, yeah, it's definitely the origins are in a lot of places, but um, all of them, just things that really spoke to me in a certain way and that I, I think will resonate with people once they get a chance and get some exposure to it. Yeah. I love, I 
love that. And even just reading the description on your soapbox website, um, I was like, I kind of, <laughs> that resonated, even with the little words you use to express it on the website, it resonated with me because I have a similar uh, belief that things should not be uh, evergreened and eternal <laughs> in terms of storytelling, you know, there should be some end. And uh, yeah, tying it to Netflix and their limited series is, is the perfect um, analogy because you're right that movies don't always do justice to stories that deserve a little bit more time, but the arc is probably usually, you know, for, you know, more often than not similar mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the buildup and then the climax. So uh, I think the limited series resonate with me as well. So to have that in comic book form is, is really cool. The one question you touched on it briefly, I had about that was, you know, how would you define literary uh, comics? Because that's a term that I hadn't engaged with before going to your website. Definitely. So um, in the aspect, it is looking at more of the genre-based comics. Um, but I think one of the major things I think about when I think of literary is uh, just tackling some type of theme. Usually we see a lot of literary works um, especially the ones that get more recognition or, or more awards, they usually are, are good at tackling a certain theme um, and, and trying to get across a certain message. So I think that's really a part of the focus of, of uh, what that literary element is really about. So like very, not just uh, based on a, a plot and action, but actually trying to unearth something that has a little bit, deeper meaning or uh, exploring certain contact concepts through the story and the characters, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. And what are you going to do with Soapbox? I suppose it's kind of the um, production company behind the Necros. And are you planning to uh, work with other comic creators and pull them into the fold and have them release their uh, works through Soapbox or primarily for your own work? Do you have collaborators already on board for future projects? What, what's the future look like? So yeah, I think for the the first year, we'll be very focused on on the Necros, just getting this under, under my toes. Um, this is like my first Kickstarter, of course. This is my first comic. Um, so there's a lot to learn uh, in, every, in every aspect um, and a lot of learning going on every day. Um, <laughs> but yes, eventually that is the plan. The plan is to uh, get more stories under, um, even things like anthologies, uh, just trying to, to get you know, different smaller works together. Um, but to, to really just grow and, and try to build out this element uh, so that it can reach more people, even if it's not, you know, solely through Soapbox, just like spreading that idea is, is more so what I want. It's not necessarily about spreading Soapbox more as, as much as it is of, you know, getting people to recognize that, you know, just like any other format, you know, comics, TV, uh, books, uh, that there is this possibility to tell stories that can be very meaningful in this format, which I think can sometimes be overlooked. Um, so really that's what it's all about. Awesome. And am I correct to that you're in Durham, North Carolina? Yes. I just moved to North Carolina a year ago. Um, okay. So um, and I'm in Raleigh. I was actually in Durham earlier today, <laughs> uh, drove through. So I'm curious uh, about the local comic book scene, like I'm from New York. And when I was growing up, there were comic book stores. There were two, I was in uh, just North of the city in the suburbs. And there were two comic book shops within drive in distance, of course, quite a few, uh, if I took the train into Manhattan. Um, mm -hmm. But when I got into my high school and college years, it was just like, poof, they evaporated. The rent was <laughs> too damn high and like, nobody they couldn't stay alive and also the internet came on and people were buying right. you know 
on eBay and then comic book websites. And then now we have uh, digital distribution, which is a beautiful thing for indie comic producers that distribution is only a click away. Um, right. So, I mean, now I just unloaded on you. You could speak to that, but specifically, I'm interested in learning about the scene in North Carolina. Um, if you're an avid comic book shop goer, um, and if you've participated at all in the community, and if that has impacted uh, your creation of the Necros. So, yeah, so when it comes to that, so I've actually only been in North Carolina for four, five years now. Oh, okay. um, it was somewhat of a long time, um, but kind, kind of similar to you, like by, by time that hit, you know, things were drying up, um, not as, not as big, but what I would, would say for North Carolina is, um, I like the different, when I would go to different festivals, there were all types of creatives everywhere. And I just felt like the, the art scene was something that was, um, just to be admired in every sense. Um, so whether Rally or Durham, I feel like both of them had uh, great communities. Um, and I, I did not go to many conventions, um, which I am looking forward to once things open back up. But even like, like I love the outdoor festivals that were, were done at both. So of course, you know, probably more than New York, North Carolina was probably like nine months where we could do outside events. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there was always, it seemed like an outdoor festival going on. So um, like, I know they have a, a Zion, Zion Fest and, and rally on, I um, uh, can't remember the name of the street anymore. Haven't been there in a while, but <laughs> on Fayetteville Street. Um, so I, I, I went down a couple years for that. Um, I know there's a whole arts week that, that they have and, I, and I, I used to go to. So um, just in general, the arts, create, the arts and creative community is just is strong in the area. And I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of passion in it. Um, and that is something I will say, like I, I grew up in Maryland and I didn't get as much exposure to up there. Um, of course, when I came down here, it was around college. So I was, you know, getting to, ex you know, explore things more for myself. Um, but I will say like, that was one of the things that just like, I, I fell in love with once I got here. It's just like, uh, I mean, I've, I've done work with um, movie studios down here um, that just, you know, just helping out in different ways with, um, with productions that are going on and just being exposed to like all the great movie, movie, uh, producers that are out here um in studios so i would say no matter it seems like no matter what the art is there are there's a good community here for it and it is a passionate and uh, connected community which of course just feels good because you know um i think with i think even with like the indie comic community where i feel i feel that same type of connection with them but like you know i think you know, the, the virus and then quarantine has pushed us to be more digital. So I've, I've met more from a lot of different areas. I also met a few from North Carolina. Um, but, you know, it's just such a supportive community. It just, you, you can't not love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I moved here right before the, the lockdown and the pandemic. So I'm, I'm like really excited to get outdoors and finally explore the going ons uh, around Raleigh and and the wider area, the triangle area. Um, and I noticed that there were like, I mean, compared to New York, if I type in comic book shop on Google, like there's a couple of pins that pop up in and mm -hmm. around the city. Um, Cause rent isn't quite as high yet, I guess, <laughs> right. compared to New York. Um, Especially on the Durham side. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. I went to one comic book shop and it seemed like it had a healthy community and they had like, they were planning events and stuff like that. So um, yeah, yeah, it's something I'm really excited and I'll definitely look out for the, the other festivals that you mentioned, cause it's definitely a lot warmer months down here as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it got me down here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, going back to the Necros, I'm curious how you plan, how you planned everything because it seems like, so uh, to be a little bit more clear, the short story that you wrote, how much of that short story 
or where does that short story leave us off in the arc of the comic book that you have planned? Mm -hmm. So yeah, for the short story, um, it's like a very abbreviated form of probably issues four through eight. Um, it's the ending of the first arc, mostly because it, it, it did focus on uh, what is the battle between Matthias and the Necros. Um, so not as much as the build up, the why, the what's going on uh, in a world, in the whole world piece. Um, so we get to, we, we see the Necros uh, pretty much every issue. Um, and we get to see kind of both sides and how they kind of come to meet together in the middle. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a lot deeper. Um, as far as planning, I think that that was probably the main aspect of, you know, how do I fit the world into this? Um, to me, I view the whole, you know, it's written in like a three act story structure. Um, and I view the, the larger story of all three books as like a three act story structure. So uh, there is a, a lot of like, how does this world play out? Like what is the current state of this world that we're in um, before really getting into this conflict and how this world is really gonna change and, and uh, kind of get to what is gonna be the message of the story. As the overall arc over the three, uh compiled volumes i guess right exactly so is it like a three act pieces nested in within a three act hole exactly three three act pieces nested <laughs> in with it. and how did you arrive at that structure was that like um I guess in the planning phase, you could have taken it any direction because obviously the world is growing very rapidly in your own mind as you wake up at night bedside, taking notes in your, in your phone. So, you know, you as the creator have the choice and this is a hard choice for a lot of creators to kind right. of kill, kill your darlings and fit it into something smaller rather than expand it into something bigger. So, you know, were there different, um, iterations and different uh, options that you were flirting with for how to structure it? Or was it pretty immediate that you decided to release it in this structure? And like, and what was the, it takes some thought and, and decision-making to, to structure it into, you know, uh, organized piece. So what is that process like for you? How do you slice and dice until it fits real? Nice. I right. didn't really mean to rhyme there, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, it started with the, the first book. So um, I, I focused on, okay, how do I kind of separate this out into the different acts? What are the different cues and the different acts? Um, and once I had that together, I was like, I know there's what the general premise of the, the larger story is, but before I really went and wrote every part of the first book, I wanted to know where I was going kind of, you know, to what we talked about earlier, kind of plant seeds and, and, and do the other things that will help make the story flow better as a whole. Um, and I am definitely a fan of trying to limit myself because I know otherwise my mind will run crazy. So I'd rather limit myself like, okay, I'm going to write a three act each book will be three X and the overall story will be three X and that's, and then try to make that work. And then if it doesn't, okay, well, we'll try something else, but just to kind of get that out of my mind so I can just focus on, on, okay, this is what it's going to be. So let's write it like this. Um, because I feel like otherwise I just play with the options way too much. And I, I do half like this and then I'd be like, well, let's try half like this. And then, a quarter like this. Let's have a side story here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think now that I've written all, all those books, I look at, like, I have the three books um, in my mind. What, I, what I'm playing with is, you know, I'll release the eight issues, like, on Kickstarter um, and then come back and do the graphic novel. But as a part of the graphic novel, there will be a one shot in each of them. And so that's where it's, okay, that's where I can flirt with a little bit of the other ideas that were in my head. Um, 
but I know, I think it was Brandon Sanderson has a pretty good clip on, I think it's YouTube and one of his classes where he talks about, you know, the issues with prequels and sequels. And I kind of take that into mind when I do side stories. Um, he talked a lot about, you know, why some prequels work versus where some don't. And same thing for sequels of just like, are you demystifying something that was only interesting when it was curious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some yeah. things are curious. And then once you find out, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's where it's like, okay, I have a lot of different ideas, but again, I'm limited to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to do any one shots outside of this. So it's like, I'm choosing the best three. What are the best three side stories to, to, to play with and, and include, you know, then it becomes almost like that competition, which I feel like keeps you at only putting the best of the best in so that you're not just like, but I know this about the world and I really want to tell you about it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And also with each issue, I guess it has to fit in thematically with that one standalone too, right? So you're further, you have for some more guardrails that help to funnel you towards a, a good decision or the best decision uh, exactly. out of what to choose. Yeah. And going back like further into your creative past, um, like when did you start writing and uh, what were you writing and how were you writing? And you mentioned that the short story, the Necros, um, that you, you had some feedback on it. Like what was the process by which you got feedback? Did you re mm -hmm. release it on a Tumblr or some other um, uh, writing website where you could share with uh, and collaborate with a community? Yeah. What, what was that background for you? Definitely. So um, I guess I'll start with the writing question. So um, for me, art has always been just like a part of me, I'll say. Um, you know, when I was young, I wrote poetry. Um, you know, I switched to doing like music production around high school. Um, I actually went to Drexel freshman year in college to do music industry um, and decided, you know, didn't want to do that. For, I didn't want to, to, to do entertainment industry full time. Um, but any specific reason why? At that I time? think for the music part, it was just like, I feel like I'm losing all the fun of music the more I learn about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the thing with me has been like, I always come back to the arts. Like, it's just something that like I have to do. I have to be doing something in that creative space. Um, so did my poetry was usually slam poetry so I was writing like you know like three minute long poems which you know is in itself usually a story and I was like what if I took this and did more actual stories because I wasn't sharing those as much and I was like I really do want to share what I'm what I'm saying um so it was you know going from a three minute long poem to now growing into a short story um which eventually grew into full story <laughs> Um, now when it came to getting feedback on those works, um, I felt like that of course is an important step of like, you know, I've written, you know, I think it's good, but like now, like, <laughs> is it actually the rubber needs um, to meet the road at some point? Exactly. Right? Gotta... <laughs> so for me, it was about finding, especially with short stories, there's a lot of places you can submit to. Um, and there were certain places that, you know, they'd say, we'd offer feedback. If, if you say you would like feedback, we will actually submit the feedback back to you. So I prioritized those first. It was, I wasn't even worried about getting published in the magazine. I was worried about getting the feedback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's free submission and free feedback from, 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 you know, professional Industry critics. professionals. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm down. <laughs> it's not going to hurt my feelings. Not that bad at least. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get over it. <laughs> so yeah, that was um that was how I went about that. So yeah, I prioritized any any submission that had feedback in it for those short stories. Um I would submit to those and get feedback. And um I wish I could remember the name of it, but there was a one specific magazine that was all focused on sci-fi and fantasy. So, you know, any story I wrote that was inside of those two was like I knew I could submit it to there. And four to five months later, back later, here, here's some feedback. Because <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know, submissions take a long time to come back. 
<laughs> when, when, when you're looking for free professional feedback <laughs> exactly and where you did you get successfully published you mentioned that you got some good feedback on the necros at least if not for many of your mm-hmm. other works did you get published so no none, none of those got published um i will say the necros so i would say a good thing about the the, the feedback is like I think from the first time the Necros was submitted, which I didn't submit to the the, the magazine again, um, like it went through a major overhaul, which is kind of kind of like what I talk about. Like you, it's been probably five or six months since you originally wrote the story. You know, you may get hurt by the comments at first, but you start to dwell on them and start to think about them a little bit deeper, and it's like, okay, now I can kind of take these things, rework them around. Um, and the magazine that I did submit to, like they had, they they like had the grade and scale, but they also had the thresholds of like this is like the threshold of like where you would get published. And like the Necros is like one point short, and it was on like grammar, which it was like my first year writing. My grammar was horrible. I know it was like it was, <laughs> it was not there yet, um, <laughs> and I wasn't paying editors to look at my work, which I do now. So that is also a great. <laughs> great <thing. laughs> So, um, yeah, between all of that, and, and, and that was part of the reason why I chose the Necros, because it was like it it passed with flying colors on originality and story and actual storytelling. Um, so, And it was just it was a like, technicality. like Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I am terrible with grammar myself, so I could <laughs> relate for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's why we value editors so much. Right? Yeah, definitely. And how, how did you... Like you mentioned, like, yeah, it didn't hurt my feelings too much. So that's as any creative has to deal with the critics, I guess, and um, constructive and less constructive criticism of their work and feedback. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that sets a great creative apart from creatives who are just starting out and trying to get, for me, that has been a big hurdle, you know, getting over, uh, feedback and criticism that I, I just don't want to hear. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like you said, you, you can reframe it and learn from it and benefit it from it and take from it what you want and not necessarily right. take all of it wholeheartedly, but pick out the pieces uh, looking, at, looking at it a little bit more objectively. Um, so I wonder if that was a learning process for you or were you always a little bit more receptive to feedback or was it something that you went in knowing that I, I just have to use this for what it is? I think it's a, a bit of, I'd say there's multiple factors that go into it. So I think for me, I've, I've always been someone who I, I do want to general, uh, you know, genuinely just progress um, and get better. And I think it's that idea of like, I'm putting the work before myself, like, you know, this is to make, sorry about that thing I lost. Your okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, generally just trying to put the work before myself. So, um, this is how, um, the story will get better. You know, this is what's best for the story and not necessarily thinking about, well, I wrote it, so it must be good. Um, and then I think the other side is being more, especially during the early times when, when you are getting feedback to be more protective with it, with what you're putting out. Um, I don't try to get feedback from a lot of people at once. You know, I may, you know, before I send it to the, uh, the, the magazine, I had like a small group of like five or six people that would read it, look over it and, and really give me feedback. And then, you know, those, that magazine, I think it was four judges. So then those four judges would give me feedback. And I think that also makes it easier because it's not like, you know, if you get 10 different, 10 people and they give you 10 different things, you just think of, well, I just got to throw the whole story away. <laughs> so if there's only a few things you have to work on, then it makes it a lot easier to focus as well on, on how to make the story better and improve it. So I think keeping your, your feedback small each time you go to get it um and then just um really recognizing that you know 
the reason you're asking for feedback is because you want to make a great story. If you just wanted to put out a story, you could just put out a story. But if you want a great story, then you know that there has to be that level of work that comes with it. Yeah, no, that's awesome advice. And also kind of reiterating or rephrasing, like divorcing yourself to some degree from what you produced so that you're not personally attached to the criticism that it's receiving. And, and then I guess, like you said, um, across the 10 or so between the five friends or five uh, people who first provided feedback and then the four or five judges, if there's a common theme among all of this diverse group of individuals and the feedback that they're providing, those are the ones that you should really hone in on and zoom in on as, as, you know, consistent uh, areas of critique and, and exactly something to take a look at. Interesting. So what was the process then? Well, before I ask this, why not make the Necros a, a book or a, or a novel? Um, because it seemed like that was an, direction that you may, a trajectory you may have been on? Was there a, a specific, you know, moment, epiphany, or, or anything that made you turn course and go towards comics? I think, ironically, um, one of the things that for some reason took me a while to notice is that, like, I don't necessarily like reading books. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so like when it comes to like actual books, like I, I read a lot of nonfiction, but there's like very select books that I like love in their book form. But I love reading comic books all the time. And it was like, why am I not writing what I love to read? <laughs> uh -huh, <laughs> Which yeah. It just felt like, you know, when you think about writing, it's like, well, you're supposed to write a novel. And then, so that's like what I tried to do at first. And then it was like, well, this is like actually like what, what, intrigues me and you know kind of going back to like what i said earlier like you know it's just that i don't associate this category with comic books really and i think that's why it also never crossed my mind it's like i didn't think like i'm telling i think if i was writing a superhero story it'd be like yeah so make it a comic book but it was like i'm writing a fantasy so it has to be a book and it was like no i can i can do this as a comic book if that's the way I think it will best fit and that's the way I think will, will really help it grow um so yeah I think it was a, a bit of realization there um and just understanding that also for me I think the story would be different as a novel versus a, a comic book and there I like the I like the way that you can non-verbally portray so much in a comic book um and i i that just that's just like excites me to think about and then i also like the collaborative process i don't i don't want to be solid while working on it and i also don't want it to just be like my mind like a lot of like the world elements um and just there's been a lot of like critique and back and forth even between like me and the artist um and just how this gets made and I think that as well makes it a better story that is not just my story that is, is being, you know, pulled together by these three, four people that are each contributing their own piece and adding their own little elements um, that help fill in this world and make it all the much better. Yeah, awesome and very, very well said. Um, I had like eight questions come to mind because <laughs> what you said was, was so rich and detailed. Um, the first is, I think, as you dis made that decision to transition it from uh, book form to comic book form, do you think it benefited more, more because it's something you enjoy c consuming more? Do you think that because you read more comics that you were better suited to tell a story in that format. Um, there were a couple of other options I had to prompt you, but really the answer is, is yours. I, I wonder specifically um, how that played out. You kind of like touched on it a little bit, but I, I'd like to explore that aspect a little bit deeper if you can. Definitely. So yeah, I think just because I, I, I like to consume that form, 
I think naturally that made me more of a critic of that form, which helped me with being able to, to make it. So it's like, because I've gone through so many comic books and, you know, when I open a comic book, I'm like, I, I hate when they do that. Like it just, you know, or like this breaks the flow. And it's just like, since I'm so cognizant of like reading through it, like when I'm reading through my pages or like, you know, trying to look through like even the ink pages, it's like, I can it's like, no, that's just, that's not going to flow well. And I think it just made it all the easier for me to actually work with this format. Um, whereas for novels, it wasn't as natural for me to critique my own work, I'll say. Um, so I think that that also plays a, a big part of it. And even just understanding certain, like for me, I love when, when you know, you get to, the, the even number page on the right side and at the at the bottom corner, it leaves you with something that just makes you like, ooh, I just can't wait to flip this page and see what's coming. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, something's coming. It's like, ooh, I just can't wait to flip it. And just like, you know, understanding the feelings and emotions that go into it all just makes it uh, more even more exciting to create. So it just like drives you more when you're actually doing it as well. Right, because you're a little bit more in control of the presentation and visual structure than you know a book you'd have to probably work really hard to get a page <laughs> flip with anticipation building for that page flip you might have to insert or delete a full paragraph or so to right. get it <laughs> timed right uh that's interesting and when you're working with your collaborators um and you're writing your own script what level of detail are you putting in there you know i've i've spoken with quite a few um, comic writers and creators. And it's a question that always gets a, a different and interesting response. And you mentioned that uh, transitioning from a book to comic, that was something that excited you because you can uh, communicate non-verbally. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I wonder how you write those non-verbal cues and verbally illustrate non-verbal communication to the people who are going to be illustrating and putting together the the images for the for the work that you're creating right i was actually thinking thinking about that today because i just sub submitted the script to the letter so I was doing like a final look through and i was like i feel like two of the pages with the with the most words on it or in the in like the script are the two pages in issue one that have no words. Like there's there's like a couple sound effects, but like there's like no words. And it's just, um, I think part of it brings me back to, uh, there was a Batman issue a few years ago after Alfred died where the whole comic had no words. Where Batman was just kind of grieving. He was still like going about the city and doing things, but like you, it struck people how powerful it was. Like this comic book was incredibly powerful, but like it had no words in the book, but you could still feel it. And it was like just knowing beforehand that you can do that. It's like okay, that really makes you think deeply about you know every panel. Just there's a lot that you can write in there, and you know sometimes for me, um, when it comes to like how many how much detail I give to the to the artist. There, are, it varies. Sometimes I know it's not my wheelhouse, I guess I'll say. Mm -hmm. So um, like there's certain pieces for like conversation. So it may be, you know, not just like a quick conversation, but like the full page may be conversation where I may leave it up to the artist where I'll, I'll go in detail about what the conversation is about, you know, how each person feels about it, but I'll let them decide how to put that on a page. And, you know, they've done a great job at like, you know, at when certain statements are supposed to come up, you know, they do a, a close up, you know, and then, you know, kind of take it further apart and even playing with perspective, which I am not one that I'm not that good at writing perspective yet, I think. Um, so just, you know, looking up at the person, at the people having the conversation, the feel that gives in itself. Um, so I, I do lean on the artist because, you know, they, they have, you know, the training and the experience to really understand like what's going to get certain things across. And then there are certain areas where I know how it needs to come across. So there's some places where it clearly says like artist choice. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is what needs to happen on the page, but like, it's your choice. Like 
tell me, you know, show me how it should go together. Um, so I think, you know, having that and, you know, they're comfortable with saying like, you know, Hey, we might need some more here versus, you know, here we're, we're, we're fine doing that. So I think it's just being able to know when to lean on each other and each other's experience. And I think now we've gotten to even like a better point. So going into writing issue three, I'm even doing the script a little bit differently because like now that we've gone through two issues that, we're, that are actually uh, fully inked, um, it's like we, I understand even more what they're better at and understand even like, you know, times where like I've written something in the script and they've like overwritten it. And it's like, yeah, that worked better. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like just having that understanding as you get to like learn each other more as people just, just uh, being able to, like I said, lean on each other and, and it makes a better masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's really an interesting point. It made me think like, you know, movies are huge productions with so many moving parts Yes. So many fingers in the creative pie or making the pie or whatever the analogy you want to make there. Um, but if you're working with the same artists issue after issue, and, and so going back to the movie statement, you, you have to follow the form because everybody expects a standard. And there's so many people coming in from different directions that they need to be able to read and understand and digest the script in a standard form. But I guess the longer you're working with, you know, a handful, two or three or four people on a comic, you get to know each other's communication styles. You get to know each other. Um, you right. get to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And so you can maybe tailor your, even your format or your style of writing to benefit the project as a whole by knowing your audience which first and foremost are the people who are taking the script to, you know, transform it into uh, a fully visual uh, medium. So I guess that's my statement. My question is um, how did you learn comic writing? Because from what I understand, the format is, you know, different. And are you writing in a standard type of format? Or are you, uh, did you make up your own format or, you know, what was that process like for you? Yes, yeah, so I would say that's definitely a more difficult process. I, I found that there was, it was kind of hard to find some, some resources on comic writing. Um, I think there was a, a Skillshare class that I actually took on it. Um, and I, I do find that that one was really helpful. Um, can't remember the exact name, but there weren't too many on there. So it shouldn't be hard. To find. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and mostly because it's, you're, you're trying to find something that's purely based on comic book writing and that comic book creation. So there are, there are a lot of content on, you know, especially if you're an artist on putting together comics. Um, so I did find that there was, you know, a, a good amount of information there, but when it came to just being like a comic book writer, um, that's where things kind of got a little bit harder. Um, I ended up for the first two issues actually doing um, more of what they could call the, the Marvel way, I guess. Um, even though I, I think from what I've heard, Marvel doesn't do it anymore. Um, so just going with like the plot where it's just straightforward, like this is what happens on the page. And then the artist translates that into a page. And then you do like the, the lettering last of like, or um, the kind of like the full script last of like, this is what it actually said in each panel because the artist is deciding what each panel looks like. Um, and I think part of the reason I did that is because I, I don't think I was confident enough to, to say like, there should be five panels and this is what it should look like. Mm. Um, now I feel like I've gotten to a place where I'm more confident and, you know, how I put, how, how I put the page together. Um, so even though, you know, I'll, I'll give five panels, they may put it together in a, in a, in their own way. Um, I think I'm more comfortable with splitting it up, um, even coming down to pacing. I think that's one of the harder things also about putting the, like separating it out into panels is understanding how do I kind of pace and where do I separate certain things out. Um, so I'll say that is one of the things I, I definitely got more co comfortable with 
over time. And now, now I feel a lot better at doing that. Um, I think, so is that something that you, you write into the, uh, script then is the pacing and the panel breaks and obviously page breaks. Yeah. So yeah. And that, and that is, um, something that when, when it comes to, to, to writing a full script, it's almost like a trade-off because I think, you know, for most stories, they could probably be written that way. But uh, when you write a full script, there's usually less revision that's needed, less back and forth. So you're saving yourself time when you write a full script. But yeah, then you are also limiting what, what is a, what is what can be done with your work because, you know, you are giving a much more detailed view of, uh, of the page. So the artists can have as much freedom with what they do. Um, I think another good thing is like now that we are a couple issues in, um, you know, some certain things are flushed out. So, you know, there doesn't need to be as much description or as much thought about how certain things go about. Um, you know, the first time you introduce what a house looks like, it has to be very specific versus, you know, it's Matthew's house. <laughs> now, we're just, now we're just writing for the second time. So also, also there's a lot more figured out by the time, you know, now we're at issue three. So, so that, that, that plays a big difference as well. Yeah. And how do you, um, how did you find your collaborators and your partners? If you need a second to adjust your phone to or whatever, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I could cut it out. So take your time. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, for finding uh, my collaborators, I actually found them on Facebook. So oh, one, wow. one thing that I found great is Facebook groups. Um, the indie comic community, there's a few different groups on there, but you know, people are active. People are they're good at answering questions. Um, so you know, there's like last week there was someone who was like, you know, I really don't know what world building is, is about, and I'm like check out this guy, Hello Future Me on, on YouTube. You know, each video is probably like 20 to 30 minutes long. So like, it's really like being in class all over again, but like <laughs> he breaks it down and like segments on segments on segments probably has like two hours worth of world bending videos. But like, I mean, just like that, if I ask a question, like somebody will get back to me with the answer like, like that. So I think, especially as a writer, especially starting out, like those groups can be really helpful. And then of course, yeah, finding collaborators you put the question out there you will have a lot of people who reach out to you um and then it's just finding you know what, what's right for for what you're trying to do and what's that process like i mean is there a lot to weed, weed through is is it a lot of, is it really just finding the art that resonates with you or the personality of the artist themselves that resonates you like uh yeah what was that process like for you to land where you landed I think it's a bit of both. Um, there's definitely a lot to weed through. Um, you, you, you have to figure out, you know, what's right. Um, for me, yeah, personality definitely played a, a big role because of course, um, like there's people in the group who talk about, you know, they're just people who, you know, have been unresponsive. So like you'll, you'll give them work and you won't hear back and, and stories like that. So, you know, that was, that was definitely one of the big things just, you know, understanding just getting a clear working relationship with the person because you know this is a person that you're working with for months on months at least for, for me doing of course doing a longer project is like you know i've been working with the same people since october um so you know the early the early stages were getting like character designs monster design getting all those done which was actually a different artist that i used for those um but getting the actual comic artist and that happened about uh, October, I believe. Um, so, you know, we've been working together for about six months now. Um, and yeah, like we, we have a great working relationship. Even now, like um, before we start issue three, like it's just going through like a retrospect period of like, you know, here are things that didn't work well on my side. Here are things that didn't work well on your side. Um, and just coming to an understanding so that, you know, every issue we just get better. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, I, I'd say it, the art of course is important, but you, you also need to have somebody that you can, you can work well together. 
Yeah. And it sounds like also, although you have a personal relationship at this point, also putting business first and right. recognizing areas where correction need to be made and um, improvements in process and workflow and whatnot can be um, yeah, brought into play. That's, that's, I think, critical. And a lot of people just want to be friends and have a good time. But at the end of the day, you gotta, you gotta kind of lay it out on the line and take criticism and give some construction, uh, constructive criticism as well to make things better and smoother and, uh, benefit the project as a whole. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. So what is the release for future? I, I mean, you just, not to put the pressure on you to release more, uh, too quickly or anything like that. But I'm just curious, um, from a creative perspective, um, this is your first Kickstarter and mm -hmm. congratulations on, from what I understand already successful and blowing out your, <laughs> your goal. Yes, um, definitely a lot, a lot more than I expected. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. It speaks to the, how the project is resonating with people and, maybe you tapped into something, you know, like you said, uh, if it was a superhero comic and concept, obviously first and foremost, you would gravitate towards putting it in comic form. But, um, I think you're at the forefront of something that I'm seeing develop in indie comics that is, you know, more types of stories can go into comics than uh, Americans have, uh, you know, thought possible maybe in, in the past. And I say Definitely. Americans because I know there's any and all types of manga out there, yeah. <laughs> like cooking manga and school life manga and gag manga and everything like that. But um, yeah, so what's your release schedule and how do you keep yourself scheduled to keep up with that? Are you like really uh, ahead of things already in story writing and, and planning and art? Um, and then, I mean, are your next three years already accounted for to make sure it happens on, on time? So for, for me, the release schedule is every three months. So once a quarter, um, I'll say we are like inks of the pencil and inks take the longest time. So, um, we have two issues inked and the reason I wanted to at least get the first two done is because I wanted to understand, okay, like on average, how long is this going to take? Not just like, well, the first time we was done in, you know, in, in two months. So that's just how <laughs> it would be. Um, so the second time, you know, Christmas happened and all of that. And so I was like, oh yeah, this holiday. So understanding, okay, three months is probably a good time frame to, to give everybody to not have to rush any workout, um, to have that good pacing, but still give people what they want. Um, so yeah, right now, every three months, we should have an issue coming out. Um, and I think right now I'm giving myself a month to get it out to people after the Kickstarter. So Kickstarter ends March 24th. Um, I hope to have everything to all the backers by April 24th. Um, so digital should be ready on April 1st. So I'll send the digitals out to everybody April 1st. Um, and then it's just actually, you know, getting the physicals, shipping them out. Hopefully, you know, there's no problems with delivery. You know, I, I think things have gotten better from the pandemic, you know, when before things were taking extremely long to ship or could just get lost. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we're in a, in a good place to, to be, to be able to deliver on that schedule, um, and kind of keep that steady cadence. So people know what to expect. Awesome. And did you, you mentioned kind of more in the middle of our conversation, um, things that you learned over the course of doing this, this being your first Kickstarter, are there any pointers or anything that comes to mind, um, from the get go? Like, I wish I did this different or something that was like, this really worked and I didn't expect it to be so impactful, but I'm glad I did it this way. I think one of the biggest things, so I'll, I'll give one big thing that I did and one thing I wish I did. So one thing I did was, um, so for my stretch goals, you know, it was, they are all, or for most of them, they are uh, another work by another indie creator. Um, usually one that's on Kickstarter at the same time as me or recently finished about to start, uh, et cetera. So um, 
I think one of the things that that did help me was just like actually networking with other creators who are going through the same thing. Um, because I, like there's stuff we talked about. It was like, hey, did you get, uh, did you try doing such and such? Like there'll be like, you'll get an email pretty much as soon as you start. Like, hey, send this out to a list of super backers and it only costs like $35. And it's like, <laughs> and all of that. And they're like, did you actually try that? And there's like, some people were like, yeah, I tried it. It didn't work. Like, okay, good. Good to know. And it's like, again, with the, just the indie community being so like helpful of just like, you know, let us only make a mistake once and, and not have to, to worry about all making the same mistake. Um, and with that, one thing that I wish I did that I didn't do is um, after probably like last week and I was doing like a, just a group call with some uh, group uh, Instagram live with some other creators, they were talking about how like, you know, I sent my my Kickstarter to, to so-and-so and they looked at it and, uh, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, I sent it to so-and-so. And I was like, I did not send mine to any other of the of the uh, indie comic creators. And it was like, you know, there were, there were people I sent it to to make sure that was like, okay, things look good, that a dog gets some feedback. And it was like, yeah, I, I should should have leaned, again, lean more on that comic creator community on like, hey, how's this Kickstarter look to you? And uh, what are some things that we can, we can improve here? And, um yeah that, that's something i'll definitely be doing next time and of course if anybody needs me to look over there i'll definitely be be happy to do the same <laughs> and how did how did you um like collaborate and with the uh other artists and other creators in that way that you're able to share their comic when you hit some uh reach goals i mean whatever you're comfortable sharing mm-hmm. in terms of the logistics of that yeah, so um, I mean, for most of them, it's digital, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, and I think, especially for other people who are, you know, early on in this process, um, it's like a trade. So it's like, you know, you know, you can use me as a stretch goal for your backers, and I can use you as a stretch goal for mine. And for all of us, it's just like, you know, I may get to hopefully to trend towards like 100 backers by the end of the Kickstarter. And, you know, that's a hundred people that get to see issue one. Um, but I am completely fine with a uh, hundred more backers from somebody else's Kickstarter also being introduced to issue one and then hopefully coming to visit when issue two comes around. Um, and I think there's like that general understanding of, you know, the, we're all on this journey to try to get it out. I think for the most part, of course, we're trying to profit. And, uh, I, you know, I don't think for any of us is, is hurting our profits to do it, but, um, I think it is just about trying to get it out. And I think it just started with like people I admired. So like, you know, Jeff was actually one of the first people I reached out to, uh, to, to offer, to offer as a, a stretch goal. And, um, you know, I, I told him, I was like, when I, when I first got on, you know, I first discovered it when I first made my like Instagram page for soapbox. Um, and I was like, man, when I, when I saw your Instagram page, like even just scrolling through your Instagram page, like, his Instagram page is beautiful. Like the way he, he like lays out the story on his Instagram page. And it's like, Oh, I wish I could do it like that. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, I was, I was just honest. I was like, Hey, like, you you know, especially, you know, also being that fantasy space, like, Hey, that's kind of like a, you know, you've been like almost like an inspiration, like a a model for me to like look at and try to try to uh, understand, especially from like a marketing standpoint, like, Hey, how do we, how do we really like gain some traction in the space? And I was like, really respect the work you're doing and would love to share it with the people who back my project. Um, so yeah, I have issue one of his as a stretch goal. Um, and of course, you know, I, we actually just reached that stretch goal yesterday. Um, so, you know, was, was, ha- was happy to, to announce that we did and also happy to link them to his Kickstarter where they could get, you know, issue two for him that he has going out right now. Right, which is almost very close. I think there's, I want to say, 20 days or so left uh, on his Kickstarter. Uh, he's very close to that goal. I'm sure he's going to make it and exceed it, but um, it's, it's awesome to see the synergy and that um, a lot of comic book cre- creators and creators in general are, general are realizing that they could share an audience. It's not like you're poaching or cannibalizing or stealing audience. Right. <laughs> like people like to read more than one thing. So uh, if you could, if you could cross reference audiences that helps everybody in the all, sh- what's the phrase, something like all ships rise with the tide. Um, mm-hmm. 
yeah, I think that's a case in point. Good example. Yeah, especially since a lot of us are like, you know, we're we're not Marvel and DC. We don't put out a book every month. Like it's this, our fans could definitely use use some more of a of what we're putting out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, very cool. I have a few more questions. I just want to, are you good with time or do you have to run off sooner than later? Um, hold on, let me check one second. Yeah, no, take your time. I could cut out as much as we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just wanted to circle back. It's kind of going back to the beginning, um, or maybe we touched on this point lightly over the course of the conversation, but, you know, you mentioned, uh, soapbox and, and uh, literary comics having more theme driven uh, stories. And I'm wondering if you could share with me a bit about the themes that go into uh, the Necros and then just like in general, what themes are important and interesting for you uh, moving forward? Definitely. So yeah, I think the Necros plays on um what I believe to be that life is more of a spectrum than black and white. Um, I think, you know, when we're first introduced to the world, there's a lot of black and white, like there's this that's good, there's this that's bad. Uh, but the more we learn, the more complex things get. And the more we understand, like, I, I think motiv motivations are one of the, the biggest things to like come, come into play. So as we start to understand people's motivations, they might be doing right things for the wrong reason, wrong things for the right reason. Um, and just getting to explore those deeper and even um, get to see the internal battles that come with, with some of both, especially uh, from Matthias' point of view. Um, I think that that is the, the main theme that we get to see throughout the Netros, explored in a few different ways. So um, definitely excited for, for when those start to get introduced more and play more of a factor. Um, I know I know like some of those, some of those moments don't really come to play until like issue like four and five. And it's like, oh, I can't wait for those to win. Like, cause I feel like that's when it starts changing from just like something you read to like, like something you really get to discuss and like even just think about deeply. Um, and I, I'm excited for when that, that turn comes as well. Yeah. It's all in the page turn building, you know, even the issue turn, you know, right. <laughs> for the next issue and having it build up to that crescendo. And the reason I asked the question in such a way was because even with the uh, preview, like I got a feeling that one of the themes, at least maybe in the first issue might be, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, mm -hmm. you know, looking at individuals as part of a group and willingness to collaborate and work as within a team and like this concept of the ego and sometimes it being necessary to be a lone wolf and sometimes uh, it also being uh, super critical in a society to collaborate and work with well with others. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, book one deals a lot with that for Matthias. Um, um, for him, it's, it's, it's harder just because of the fact that, you know, he, growing up in most of his life, he was kind of a lone wolf. Um, so yeah, for him, we get to see early on in issue one that like him and teams are not like cohesive. They don't, they don't usually go in the same sense. <laughs> so, so yeah, we definitely do get to see a lot with that and um, just get to experience like how does, you know, I think a lot of times with stories, a lot of stories, you know, almost like romance where it's like, it's destined to be, so it will be, but you know, it's not, it's not that easy. There's a lot of complexity to it. Um, so yeah, we really get to explore that with Matthias uh, in book one and in, in his point of view, we get to see how that all plays um, and into that motivation piece, how he almost gets to understand people better as people when he you know he has to recognize that other people have their own motivations as well um so i i think we get to see a, a little bit of all of that uh throughout the first the first book and do you have a mind when you're writing it to write it a little bit from uh his 
perspective. Another note, and again, this is just based on um, the, the preview, but kind of uh, got the sense that it may become more of a like coming to age story. So uh, I guess, how do you balance the overall arc and narrative and themes and, and then the character by which you're exploring them and make sure that the character isn't bigger than the themes and the th themes aren't uh, bigger to the character where the, to the point where they become irrelevant. Those kind of balances are always uh, really interesting for me. I think the balance for me comes in the fact that um, the only person whose thoughts we ever get to see are Matthews. So um, for the main story, um, like I said, one shots can take a different approach, but for the main story, that's the only person whose thoughts we get to see. Um, so even though we get to explore this grand world with these grand themes, um, at the end of the day, we're still brought back to how Matthias processes everything that's going on um, and how it all sits with him and, and uh, plays into his journey. So um, yeah, it definitely does have a coming to age journey for, for him throughout. But um, yeah, that's kind of where it comes back to, I, I guess I'll say where it keeps grounded. Um, it's, it's due to the fact that that's the only person's thoughts we'll ever see um, besides, I guess, the narrator. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think, I think that's how it helps, it helps the story balance both of those. Mm, yeah. Interesting. And do you see yourself in Matthias or any other character? Is it uh, at all a personal story for you? I think for most of my main characters, I, I try to give a piece of myself. So I try not to base too much on myself because I feel like then, you know, then all the characters will be the same. But for all of my main characters, I, I think of um, usually just something I struggle with um, and then try to put it into this, this world and see how, how that kind of would grow and, and, and form into its own character. Um, so for me, um, there were, there were many times where I felt like I was like, uh, a, a lone wolf almost, um, and just didn't, I guess didn't see the value of teams. I was like, but I, I know I can do this myself. So it's like, I, I don't want to slow myself down by, by having a team and, and trying to work with them. Um, and so, yeah, I, that, that is like a flaw that I like actually dealt with myself. So then it's like putting that into this element where like the problem is like, I mean, like I said, almost like the predator where it's like the problem is so grand that like nobody should think they should be able to do this themselves. But <laughs> so like, how does that all play into it? And, uh, you know, how does, how does that, uh, play out in this world? Yeah. And then relating that back to, you know, having that, having been an experience of yours as kind of a lone wolf and carrying maybe too much of a burden on your shoulders, how has that impacted how you, collaborate and uh you know sometimes that's a difficult a dif difficult process for people not only finding collaborators but then figuring out exactly how to work with other people when it is you know your project your concept your idea um so in terms of uh the process of that but also relinquishing control is that something you had to learn to do or like at, at what stage of your life did you open up in that way? So yeah, I will say it's something that I did like have to have to learn to do um, in life. I think at, at this point I was, um, I was, I was fine with it from, from a, a world perspective. Um, again, I'm just like putting the story first and knowing like, Oh, this is going to make an incredible story. But also at the same time, I just realized for me, it's important to like, be be particular with who I pick, which I think, you know, made it probably all the more, you know, daunting for me to have to like actually make a choice on somebody. Um, so I was like super, I guess, hesitant and like, all right, this is, if, this is the person that's going to get to work with it. Like I have to be, I have to be super sure about this, but like once I made the decision, um, I guess almost like coming back to like me, like writing, writing the, the some of the parts of the book, like, I had to make the decision. And then once I make the decision, I don't question the decision. I just move forward and, and make the best of the decision I made. So um, 
you know, definitely feel like I, I made a, a great decision in, in the artists that I picked. But, um, but yeah, it's just having to actually go through the process of picking was something something I wouldn't want to go through too often. <laughs> <laughs> That, I think I, I jotted down where I put it. It was in my notes already. Um, yeah, I jotted down, put the story first. I think that's a, that's a great way to frame it and also make the decision and then move forward. Those are two pieces of really uh, timeless wisdom, I think, in, the crea- in any creative space because we could always get hung up on wishing that we did something differently or... Definitely putting something first that's not the project itself, which then how could you expect the project to be the best that it can be? Awesome. Well, I, I mean, that's it for the questions that I had written down, but if you want to go in any and all direction, tangentially, tangentially, <laughs> um, or, you know, wrap it up with a, a comment or question. Um, yeah. Any, anything else that you would like to explore? I think that that was definitely uh, covered a lot. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I've ever gone into that much depth. So uh, yeah, it was definitely great questions and uh, great to even explore some of those things um, that I think I don't even think about up front. But you know, especially those those like writing, some of those writing techniques. It's like after a while, it almost becomes like you know, once you get a, a few years into it, it feels like this is just how I go about it, and it almost somewhat happens subconsciously you just like know how you work so you start to work like it um so to even just try to think about it and have to be like conscious about it was definitely uh good to do and hopefully it does help some some other people trying to write out there because i know it is not an easy process Uh, (laughs) (laughs) there's a thousand million ways to do it but uh once you do it, it it's incredible to get on the page yeah. Yeah. And doing the work is more than half the battle. And, uh, like you said, there's, there's more than one way to do it. And I really appreciate you sharing, um, your way. I think there was one point I was like writing and creating and I was like, it was just like a realization that not everybody does it this way. And that was right. one <laughs> of the many reasons I started the podcast was to have people elaborate on their process and their approach, uh, like you did with exactly. me today. Yeah. And, and you were very well equipped and, and provided uh, some of the, some of the best answers I've heard in a long while. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. All right. Well, we are very much looking forward to the digital and physical release of the Necros, which, uh, you know, postal service pending will ship and deliver <laughs> it to you sometime the end of April, but definitely the digital copy will land in your inbox once the, uh, the project is uh, finishes its fundraising on Kickstarter. It already hit its goal and congratulations uh, for that already. But uh, yeah, don't, don't stop the process. Don't stop pushing yes. the project forward. We're excited for your whole world to be realized with its definite and um, <laughs> final punctuation at the end because we know that you're no, uh, you're no fan of endless stories. Um, not at all (laughs) yeah so Dion thanks again for joining me here on what's your random and until next time enjoy the random hey guys uh welcome to this the debriefing of our 27th episode of what's your random podcast and today was a really fun episode let me just say it here say it loud say it proud the story comes first i think that's the biggest key takeaway of mine from this uh interview with dion and how to not lose sight of what's important when you set a goal for writing a story that's the goal the goal has less to do about you and more to do about the actual story you are trying to tell and communicating it right turning that idea into something that is uh tangible that you could share with others as i often say in the introduction of this podcast so thinking about it in those terms i think think is uh really helpful and i hope that you 
took away that and or a similar and or other beneficial uh, key takeaways. If you have your own key takeaway, please do holler at us at What's Your Random on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Just, I mean, make a comment somewhere, YouTube, and let us know what you're thinking, what your takeaways were, if you were related, if you have any, I don't know, random ideas about the episode that we just listened to. Uh, we love to hear from you. And uh, in terms of improving the own, my own podcast here at What's Your Random, a um, little technical thing I'm trying out. I put some foam in front of my computer screen here, which I'm looking at now. Uh, looking at the camera, looking at the screen, looking at the camera, looking at the screen. Um, it's, I'm still getting used to filming myself and watching myself on a live feed as I'm being filmed and doing it myself. You know, it's kind of, uh, never feels totally normal, but, uh, yeah, I put this foam in between me and the computer and created a little bit of a box to help dampen some of uh, the echo I felt I was getting or improve the audio slightly. Um, I could probably tuck this microphone into here a little bit. Maybe we can hear a benefit while I was also getting closer to the microphone myself. But um, yeah, little incremental changes. Um, those weren't all that expensive. And it help, if it helps improve the show, I think it is uh, extremely worthwhile because that's what is part of my process is, uh, the podcast is ongoing and as an ongoing creative endeavor, I try to find areas where I can improve it, uh, with each episode I release. So that is the extent of the going ons here behind the scenes at what's your random. Um, we really appreciate you listening said, always say it in the intro, but it really does go a long way if you share, uh, and help us get into the ears of other creatives who will benefit hopefully from hearing, uh, my interactions with my guests who have a wide variety of approaches to creating their wide variety of creative art. Um, so yeah, thank you again for listening and until next time, enjoy the random. Random.